Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to be here this morning. I hope that that encourages okay. you today as we get ready to enter into this new year. And um, I want to see you have the best year of your life. Amen. Does anybody else want that for themselves this year? Amen. 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 Some people say that you shouldn't ask for things like that, but I beg to differ. The Bible is full of people who wanted a transformation and a change in their life. And uh, you can find it in the Old Testament, the New Testament, and <coughs> my testament. Amen. I want to change in my life. I want to see God do amazing things in and through me. I was not born on this earth to just exist. If you were, then you're in the wrong place this morning. Amen. Uh, God didn't call us to be ordinary. He called us to be extraordinary for Him. And uh, this morning, I want to encourage you as we get ready to enter into this new year. I think that as we get ready, we're only days away. We're on the cusp of the new year. And as we get ready to do that, I was praying and honestly, I was trying to stay away from the traditional New Year's message. Amen. I mean, like just, the, just the thought of, hey, we're going into a new year and all these things, but God just would not leave me alone as I was praying over and preparing for this this week. And, um, and so this morning, I want to talk to you about a fresh start because how many of you would like to get a fresh start? Amen. I know for me, there's been many times I just want a fresh start. I just want to erase all the mistakes, all the mess, all the mix-ups, all the failures, all the faults. I'd like to just erase all of that and get a fresh start. Sometimes in your relationships with your uh, significant other, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your husband, your wife, you have to just say, hey, can we just forget everything that's happened and let's just have a fresh start, right? Um, and the Bible says that God's mercies are new every now. And that's encouraging to know that his mercy is new every single day. We can get a fresh start every day. And that applies to this new year. And uh, what I really struggled with coming in today, once I settled and, and let God be God and settled on what we were doing today and talking about the new year, was to give you a message of some importance that I will probably deliver in a teaching or preaching here soon. But 2020 is very significant. Um, if you just want to take your time and go do it yourself, you can. Go look up the Bible and num numerology, the study of Bible, biblical numerology, and look up the number 20. And when you think about that being doubled, which number two is the number of witness, you'll find amazing, I believe, God-inspired prophetic truth in the year 2020. And it's going to be an amazing year for people of God who do what that guy just said and who's willing to fight, sleep, lose sleep, lose, lose food. Lose whatever and go after what God's got for you. Amen. And so this morning as we get into that, I want to talk to you for a minute because um, I think that this morning many of us are in that mindset. We're looking and, and a lot of things this morning. And I want to really break down what should be happening in your life through the words of Paul this morning as you get ready to break through. Not only, listen to me, not only into a new year, but do you realize it's a new decade? You don't only get to erase last year this time. You get to erase the last 10 years and say, God, I've really not done that great the last 10 years. But this is my chance to start over. This is my chance to let this decade be the decade of destiny. Does anybody want a decade of destiny for 2020? Not your destiny, his destiny for your life. Amen. Because you're created with a purpose. The Ecclesiastes 3 says to everything there's a season and a purpose under heaven. You were created with a purpose. And so if you believe that, I can tell you your purpose is not to fail God. Your purpose is to be faithful to God and let him fulfill his destiny in your life in this decade. Amen. I believe it's the decade of destiny. And so this morning as we look at this, we're going to look uh, at one verse of scripture and it's going to lead to more. But the Bible says in Psalm 65 and verse number 11, because we're all making resolutions, right? And the definition by Merriam-Webster of resolution is to determine. And so people are determining now that, hey, and they've already talked about it, already heard people saying it, it's every year, it's, it's the common resolution. If not already, within the next few days, you're going to see Planet Fitness and Gold's Gym and, and all this stuff all over your TV every 30 seconds in a commercial. You're going to see some, some gym commercial saying, hey, no membership fee, no none of this. You're going to see Weight Watchers just bombard your television screen. And the reason why is because everybody wants to make a resolution after gaining 20 pounds at Christmas that we're going to lose 50. Right? <laughs> 
And, and the gyms, the gyms are smart in their sales tactic because what happens is they get you, except for Planet Fitness, they get you hooked in in that gear membership and you go one month and you're done. <laughs> right? Let's be honest. Because we have determined in December that we're going to work on our summer body, <coughs> but before spring even hits, we're sprung and we're done. <laughs> right? And so determinations are good. Determinations are good. It, it's like having intentions. Right. Intentions are good. Right. But intentions are simply that. They're just a determination. They're just an intention. They're just a, a good idea. <coughs> They're just a good thought. And so, <coughs> excuse me. So this morning, as we look at this, <coughs> we're going to get into this. Can somebody grab me a bottle of water? There's one in the fridge tonight. <clears throat> and so in Psalm 65 11, the Bible says, You crown the year with your goodness, and your paths drop fast. Now listen to that. <clears throat> because we're entering into a new year. <clears throat> and the Bible says, and this is a Psalm of David, he says, God, you crown the year, a specific year, thank you, man. You crown the year with your goodness. And your paths drop fatness. Now, I wonder if you don't mind, let me let me read it to you out of the English Standard Version, I believe it is, I put up here. So just look at it with me real quick. And I did the word studies. There's nothing wrong with this text. So look at it with me. Is it on the screen, Bradley? Or no, I just had it. Never mind. Uh, you crown the year with your bounty. So goodness and bounty is the same word. You crown the year with your bounty. Your wagon tracks overflow with abundance. Now, when you think about that, that sounds familiar to me. Because in John 10 and 10, the Bible says Jesus is talking. And he says, the thief comes not before to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But I have come. I have come. He says, your wagon tracks, your paths. I have come. The Bible says, I will lead you in what? Paths of righteousness. For his name's sake. Your paths. I have come. That you can have life and have it more abundantly. That's the fact. Amen. That's the fact. Christians don't like fat on the steak. Shelly loves it. I used to like it when I ate beef. It's where the flavor's at. Amen. That's the good part of the steak is the fat. Amen. And, and so when you get the fat, you get the goodness. Amen. The fat means the goodness. It means the bounty. Listen to what happened with Ruth in Ruth 2 and 16. The Bible says that, that here we find the near kinsman telling his, his servants. He says, and let fall also some of the handfuls of purpose to her. Amen. And lead them that she may glean them and rebuke her not. In other words, he says, hey, drop handfuls of purpose. Now, a lot of people say, Joe, you're on this purpose kick and it's not good. It is good because God says through the near kinsman here, which is a picture of Jesus, drop handfuls on purpose of purpose because it's going to serve a purpose for her. And David says in his psalm that let this year, dear God, let your blessings be on this year. Let it be crowned, the crown surrounded with your bounty, with your goodness. And let your wagon tracks, as I'm following you, because the only way you're going to get in the track of the wagon is if you're following the wagon. Right. And so he says, as I follow you in your wagon tracks, I pray to God that you would let them overflow with abundance. Now, we heard the video, and what has to happen for us is we have to make a shift. As we get ready to enter a new year, every year we have to make a shift mentally. We have to begin to contemplate. We have to begin to think. We have to begin to discern. We have to begin to decide. And Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, his mercies do every morning, right? By the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. In other words, what he says, you want to give God worship, just lay down your life. Lay down your life. Quit living it for you. Your life doesn't belong to you. How many of you have been bought with a price? How many of you that price was the precious blood of Jesus? Then who am I to say my life is my own in 2020? Who am I to say this decade is for me? And I have to say, God, it's for you. You died for me. 
You paid the ultimate price for me. And so why shouldn't I serve my king and my lord as I call him? But listen to verse 2. And be not conformed to this world. Here it is. But be you transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. So I have to renew my mind as I get ready to enter 2020. That you may prove. Prove what? What is that good? And acceptable. Listen. And perfect will of God. So God has a perfect purpose for your life. But he also allows a permissive will in your life. He's got his perfect will and his permissive will. And I believe so many of us are living in his permissive will. It means that he permits it. He allows it. He allows it. It's not that it's his perfect or his acceptable will. It's his permissive and allowing will that allows us to walk through life and do a lot of the things we do. And God says, well, I really you know, didn't want you to go to the left. I didn't want you to go to the right. This is my promise for you that I will let you have a life of abundance. I will surround your life with goodness and blessings. But I need you to follow the wagon tracks and you keep getting off course. And I'm not going to jerk you back right now. I'm going to let you go for a little bit like a prodigal son or daughter. You're not in my perfect will. You're not walking, living, breathing, eating, sleeping, drinking, waking up, going to bed, living your purpose that I created you to do. But I want to get you there. So how do we get there leaving a decade and a year behind? And rolling into a new decade and a new year in 2020. How do we get there? What if we decided to change our attitude from having a resolution, making a determination, to starting a revolution? Well, what is the difference? Revolution, defined by Miriam Webster, is a fundamental change in the way of thinking about or visualizing something. It's a change of paradigm. When you think about the word revolutionary, it means constituting or bringing about a major or fundamental change. Here's an example. You hear it all the time. This is a revolutionary new product. Right? It means it's such a dramatic change. It's such a dramatic transformation in the market that, that, that it has to get noticed. Wouldn't it be awesome if God said, this is your year to start a revolution? Now, the other definition for revolution is this. The other defining term for revolution is an uprising against the government. Well, can I tell you something? We need to have an upheaval. We need to have an uprising. Not against the United States of America, whether we agree or disagree. Not against anything natural, but of a supernatural uprising. Because there's two kingdoms in this world. And there's the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. There's the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. And we are just going with the flow. And instead of rising up and causing an upheaval, we need a revolution. And the only way to really have a revolution is to walk and live and breathe and exist in your purpose that God created you for. And so how do I do this, preacher? How do I do this? Well, in Lamentations 3 and 40, the Bible says, let us examine our ways and test them. And then let us return to the Lord. Let me examine my way. So as we go in, isn't this what we're doing? We're taking an examination of our life. We're taking an inspection. You have to inspect things, right? Every year you get your vehicle inspected. And what they're doing is seeing if it's in, in, uh, in compliance, thank you, in compliance with the standards of your state or your government. And so you have to make sure that everything's in compliance. Well, wouldn't it be good for us to see if we're in compliance? This morning with the Lord and his will and his way so that I can, as, as Romans 12, 2 says there, I can be transformed by the renewing of mind that I can prove, yeah. I can prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You see, we talk about we want to see God move in our life. We want to see God do great things. And the reason we're not, folks, is because we're not having that attitude. We're not going into a new year with that. A lot of us are going in looking at the physical, and the physical is important. Do all you can for this here so you can live as long as you can. Amen? I know everybody's saying, hey, I just want to get out. I want to go home. I'm ready for Jesus to call me out. I'm ready for Jesus to call me home. I don't really believe you are. Not if you understood the context. I think we all have this vivid imagination that every one of us that are saved are going to hear, well done. That's a lie of the enemy. 
There's going to be those standing there with nothing but smoke and ashes. Yeah, right. yeah that's a sobering thought, isn't it? So I can tell you this, that there was a decade that rolled around in my life that if I would have died in the decade previous, I would have stood there ashamed, embarrassed. I would have stood there with, with <laughs> nothing to give him. I would have stood there with just standing there with nothing but the smell of smoke and he saved me from fire. But I'm standing there with the smell of smoke and I'm standing there with a pile of ashes because I was putting everything in my life before everything he wanted in my life. And I wasn't being blessed and I didn't understand. I was blessed. I never went without food. I never went without shelter. But I wasn't walking in the fatness. I wasn't walking in the wagon tracks. I wasn't walking with him saying, hey, hey, uh, Holy Spirit, drop him a handful of purpose. Drop him a handful of own purpose. Drop him, drop him more than what he needs. Let him walk in the abundant life. I was just surviving instead of thriving. <laughs> and this morning, I don't know about you, but I believe it's time for God's people to quit just simply surviving. Oh, yeah. And begin to live the life God has called us to live. So what we find is an inspection. And an inspection needs to view closely. In critical appraisal. Now this is the thing. We want to look at everybody else's life and critique it. But when's the last time you critiqued your life? When's the last time you got critical with yourself? When's the last time you looked at yourself and said, Hey man, I'm, I'm just not doing what I should be doing. It means to officially examine. And so we have to have an inspection. And the, the, the writer of uh, Lamentation says, Let us examine our ways. Not only examine them, not only inspect them, but test them. Test them against what? The Bible says that your, your works, not your salvation, your service. Amen? This is not about redemption. This is about rewards. Your works will be tried, tested, through the fire. And they'll come out either as precious uh, gold and silver and, and, and gems, or they're going to come out as wood, hay, and stubble. It turns into ashes when it goes through the fire. And so we're not talking about are you going to heaven. It's talking about what are you doing to bring heaven to earth. Jesus said, let your kingdom come. Bring heaven to earth. It's, you, we're, too, we're too focused on getting to heaven that we're forgetting people on earth need heaven. They need Jesus. They need the kingdom of God. And so as we look at that this morning, not only do we see an inspection, but and I'm going to use some big words that I had to look up. <laughs> God gave me the first one, and I was like, okay. And then I began to search, and I was like, wow, there's a lot of these inspections. So not only inspection, but retrospection. Retro means old, right? Going backwards. And so retrospection is the act, the process, of, or an instance of surveying the past. Now, if you would, I would love for you to turn with me in Philippians chapter 3. It's not on your screen, so I hope you brought your Bible. If you don't have your Bible, I hope you've got a smart device that has a Bible. And in Philippians chapter 3, I want you to look with me in verse 4 through 8. Philippians chapter 3, verse 4 through 8. Because we find that Paul, I don't know if this was written around the time of New Year's. But I can tell you this, he's doing a New Year's type of process, an inspection. He says, though I must, let me, hold on one second. So in Philippians 3, and we're going to begin reading in verse number 4. The Bible says, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinks that he has whereof he might trust in the flesh, I'm more. I was circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and the Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law, I was a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, I was so zealous that I persecuted the church, touching the righteousness which is the law of blameless. <coughs> But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yes, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, to whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dumb. That's, that's fecal matter waste, that I may win Christ. Amen. You see what Paul's doing here is he's doing a retrospection. He's looking over his life of his past and he says, listen, you want to talk about who's holy and who's right, who's righteous? You're looking at him, buddy. I was a Pharisee. I was zealous. I killed people for the church. Amen. I did all these things. He says, but you don't understand. I, when I found Jesus, when I found my purpose in Christ on the Damascus road and I was laying on the bed blinded, it took God blinding me to give me to see vision. Do you want God to have to blind you to get you to see? 
He says, but when that happened, he says, I realized the truth of my life. And it wasn't to go kill the church. It was to grow the church. It wasn't to go after these people who were living for Jesus. It was to chase them and get them to find Jesus of every nation, of every tribe, of every tongue, of every people. And so what we find is retrospect is a survey of the past, a looking back in order to evaluate past events and put them into perspective. The word retrospect is almost always used with preposition in as in retrospect. Usually when looking at something in retrospect, one sees how a situation could have been handled differently or that another path could have been taken. Isn't it funny? It's about a path. In your wagon path. Is where the abundance of the blessings fall. Amen? <clears throat> so I'm good at taking a different path. The word retrospect is derived from the Latin word retrospectum, meaning to look back. And so we find that in this season, we're looking back, aren't we? We're looking back and we're saying, hey, how did I do this year? Did I meet my goals, my personal goals, my spiritual goals, my financial goals, my, 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 my career goals, my, my grades for my college? Did I meet my goals this year? Did I become the better wife, the better husband, the better mother? Did I, did I become uh, what God wanted me to be this year? What did I do this past year? And then to get real serious, hey, let's go back to 2010. Woo, now we're really retrospective. Amen? Let's go back 10 years. Isn't it funny that, that vinyl has come back around? You know? I've even heard cassette tapes and boom boxes are coming back. I'm like, how ridiculous. I don't want to stick a pencil in my tape anymore. I'm done with that. Play, play it for me, Siri. Digitally. Amen? You have retrospect in a lot of things. But Paul says here, he says, I remember where I came from. I remember what you brought me out of. And as a matter of fact, in Deuteronomy, God tells the children of Israel to remember what he brought them from. So retrospect isn't completely a bad thing. God gives you a memory for a reason. But this is what he doesn't want you to do. He doesn't want you to take camp and live there. And so many people going into 2020 are going to have a struggle of a year. And going to have a year that is hard because they have still camped out in 2010. <coughs> In 1980, in 1974, they're camped out there and they're remembering and they're living in, because of their memory, everything that hurt them, everything that happened to them, all the abuse they suffered. They're living in all the mental torment they went through and they can't get to their promise because of their past. And so the thing is this morning is Paul says here, look, I remember it, but listen to what he says, but I let all that just go on to the waste. It doesn't matter. I was the most educated of the, of the people of, of Israel. I was, I was, he said, I was blameless. What an egotistical guy he is. He says, look, I was perfect. When you want to talk about a religious man, I had it down to the letter. My tie was tightened just right. It had just a perfect tie. I, I, I had my hair fixed. I said the right words. I prayed the right prayers. Everything I did, I did. I believed I was right in doing. He said, but the moment that Jesus showed me the truth, the truth set me free. And in that moment, it transformed my life and my thinking began to change. Because Paul's the one that said, renew your mind. He said, I realized I was walking in God's permissive will. He permitted me to be religious and to be a zealot. He permitted me to, to have stand by and hold the coat of a man who was proclaiming the gospel while they threw rocks at him. He permitted me to get a decree and go after people because he knew that it would be on that very road that he would fall and I would fall, not only into his permitted uh, will, but into his physical presence. And in that moment, it would change my life. And so this morning, I want to encourage you to do a retrospection this morning. Look over your life over this past year. What would you change? What paths would you not take? What words would you not say? What actions would you not do? How would you make your life better? And then by doing that, we can't stop there, though. And I believe so many people stop there. They're like, okay, I'll do the retrospection part, Pastor. What else? What else? So we've inspected our life as a whole. And to do that, we have to have retrospection. But then we have to have introspection. Introspection is a, re a reflective looking inward. An examination of one's own thoughts and their feelings. 
It's a big word used especially in psychology. Let's do some introspection. Let's, let's look into you and see what's going on with you. <clears throat> Counselors use these type of theories and theologies when they do counseling. Let's see what's going on inside of you. Let's see what's, what's the turmoil within you. Let's do an introspection. And so when we think about that, in Philippians chapter 3, again, verse 12, the beginning part of that verse, it says, Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect. Verse 13, the beginning part, says, I count my not myself to have apprehended. And so we find that Paul is doing an introspection. He says, I've not yet got there. I'm not as mature in the faith as you would like to believe I am. Now, this is Paul. This is the guy that wrote the majority of the New Testament. This is the guy that God took from murderer to messenger. This is the guy that God took from appalling to apostle. This is that guy. And this guy says, hey, I'm not arrived yet. In other words, I still have purpose. My life isn't finished. I've not fulfilled my race. I've not run it completely yet. I'm on the racetrack. I'm running. I've not finished my fight. I'm in the ladder round. Fighting, I'm giving everything I've got, but I'm not just there yet. I've not apprehended it. I've not reached my plateau. I still got purpose. I still got destiny. I still got dreams. I still got desires. And Paul says this. He says, I had to introspect. I had to look in myself and see who I am. Who am I? And what am I feeling? And why do I do what I do? Some of you right now are struggling with the same sin you've been saying you're going to cast off for the last 10 years. And this can be your year of victory. This can be the year you do it. But the only way to do it is to introspect. You have to take an examination of yourself. David said it like this again. He said, Lord, search me. Search me. Because if I'm going to introspect, I would rather have the, the, the chief inspector inspect me, wouldn't you? Because I'm, I'm not as critical as I should be to myself. And so I say, Lord, search me and see if there's any wicked way in me. Now, you already know it, but you just gave it a label that it's okay. And then when God begins to search you through his Holy Spirit, he reveals to you those cancerous tumors in your body. And you've got the choice, will I leave it and maybe let it kill my destiny? The guy said it's your thinking. I believe that. T.D. Jake said it's your thinking that'll kill your destiny. Nobody, listen to me, nobody can stop what God wants to do in your life but you. And you say, but I can't stop it. If God wills it, it's going to happen. You believe that lie if you want to. The children of Israel delayed going into, into Canaan land and then they changed their mind later and God said no. What happened? They stopped God's perfect will for their life. And I'm going to tell you this morning, you can stop it. Nobody else can stop it but you. The devil can't stop it. Your spouse can't stop it. Your parents can't stop it. The school can't stop it. The kings and queens and governments can't stop it. But you can. And I don't want to see you cause death to what God has designed you for. And so you have to be willing to change your mind. You have to be willing to do a retrospection and an introspection. Now, when you think about this word introspection, some synonyms for this word is self-contemplation, self-examination, self-observation, self-questioning, self-reflection, self-scrutiny. We don't like that word, do we? Self-searching and soul-searching. Now, you've heard me teach some on the soul, and the soul is the real you. So it's time to get to the real you, the one God made, not the one the world's made you into be. And say, God, what is missing? What is lacking? What am, I, what am I not finding to be the real me you designed me to be? Amen? You didn't know it was so detailed to figure out this new year, did you? Then you have, not only do you have an inspection that needs to happen, which involves retrospection and introspection, but then you've got prospection. This is where we get the word prospect. Now, I work with a guy, and he says that some women in the world are prospectors. If you think about the word prospector, it means a gold digger. 
He said, yeah, man, there's some women out there that's nothing but gold diggers. You drive a nice car and live in a nice house, they don't care if you look like crud. And you don't have no personality. They just want what you got. Amen. That's not the prospecting I'm talking about. This prospection we find in Philippians 3, the last part of verse 13, and the last part of verse 14. Look at what it says. He says, for this one thing I do. Let me stop there and ask you this question this morning. What is your one thing? Everybody has one thing they do. And you do it well. And God will show up in your one thing. Can I tell you what he says in Malachi 3 and verse number 10? He says, if you'll be faithful to me in your tithes and your offerings, I will pour you out a blessing. One thing. That if you'll take that blessing and use it, the world or you can't contain what I have with it. I'll, I'll just drop abundance and fat all over the place in my wagon tracks because you're following the blessing. You see, what is your one thing? Because your one thing is so crucial. You have to understand your why before you understand your way. What's your one thing? <coughs> What's your one thing this morning that God has given you that you do well Ronda Rousey, who's an MMA fighter, y'all know me. Uh, the, I heard her say one time that her mama had trained her so much in jujitsu and so much in the art of, of the arm bar that her mother would jump on her bed at 3 o'clock in the morning, literally, literally, because she was an Olympic jujitsu medalist. And her mom would come in at 3 o'clock in the morning in the dead of her sleep, jump on her bed, and Ronda Rousey's reaction was to grab her in an arm bar. Because it was who she was. It was who she was meant to be. It was her instinctiveness. What is that for you? If you wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning, what is it you could do at the drop of a hat? What's your one thing? What's your one thing? Somebody said pee. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Just get out of the bed first, right? Or at least have some, some garments on or something. Do something about it. Amen. But here's the thing. Is that Paul says, for this one thing I do. Forgetting the things that are behind me. Now wait a minute. He just talked about retrospecting, right? Forgetting the things that are behind me. But look what he said. This is what I'm doing. I'm trading off. I'm getting a better trade-off. Because what I'm doing is I'm forgetting the things that are behind me. Because I can't look back. Because I'm so, so focused on what's ahead of me. I'm reaching forward. To the prize of the mark of the high calling of God in Jesus Christ. Amen? And he says, I press toward that mark. So we see that he is doing a prospection. He is looking forward. Prospection means the act of anticipating, the act of viewing. It means the act of prospect, means the act of looking forward with anticipation. It's a mental picture of something to come, which is vision. And where there is no vision, we talk about that with church. What about that for you who are the church? What's your vision? What's your dream? What's your desire? What is it that God showed you, little Joseph? Where's he going to take you? This seems absurd. Something that is awaited or expected. It's a possibility. And God wants to do this in your life, I believe, this year. But you're going to have to be willing to take a retrospection. You're going to have to be willing to do some inspection. And you're going to have to be willing to do some introspection. And you're going to have to be willing to do some prospection. You see, the thing is, pro means positivity. Pro. Pro. Amen. It's a good, it's a good word. Not like negative thoughts. It's pro, proactive. Amen. Proactive. It means I'm going to take action before I need to take action. It's kind of like the, the, the children of Israel and the walls of Jericho with Joshua. They were proactive. They haven't seen anything, but they believe it. And they just keep walking around the walls, trusting God that he's going to do what he promised he would do. And so this morning, would you be proactive? Would you be willing to say, God, I haven't seen it. I haven't even seen a, a, a you talk about fat dropping off the wagon. I've been trying to follow you here lately, and I don't even see the crumb drop off the wagon. Well, let me tell you what happened in the Bible. There was a woman who came to Jesus, and she was begging for healing for her daughter, and Jesus called her a dog and told her to get away from the table. Now, how rough is that? But you know what she said? 
He was testing her. He was testing her. Because what she said was, she said, Lord, it's okay, I'll be your dog. Because even the dogs get the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Can I tell you something? In that crumb of bread is everything that's in the whole loaf. And this morning, God says, hey, if you'll follow me for the crumbs, I'll give you greater than the crumbs. I'll give you so much that you won't even understand. But I just want to see if you'll follow me to get a crumb before I can give you the whole concept. And so this morning, just follow him for the crumbs. Follow him for what he's giving you right now. Be like Hansel and Gretel and just follow your crumbs all the way back to the house where God is. And watch when you get there. Watch what he's got for you. But this morning, the only way that's going to happen is if you do these things. Lastly, this morning, I want to talk to you about direction. Because look what he says in Philippians 3, verse 12 through 14 again. In verse 12, he says, I follow after. In verse 13, he says, I'm reaching for. And in verse 14, he says, I'm pressing toward. That's all direction. And what Paul is saying is, I will not make a 180 degree turn and go back the way I can. I will keep going. We used to sing a song, Onward, Christian Soldier. Marching as to war. On. My daughter used to love a group called One Direction. She's still in love with one of the guys in the group. <laughs> this is the thing. Is that it would do us well as Christians to get that mentality. There's only one direction. There's only one way. Jesus said there's one direction. One way. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no man can come to God except by me. And so this morning, if we want to get to God, then we have to go the way Jesus is going, right? And if he's going the way, that means he's preparing the way. That means he's providing along the way. That means he's protecting along the way. I can promise you, if you, if you were in some ancient civilization where there was kings and queens, and you were following the wagon of the king, you have nothing to worry about. You have nothing to worry about. If you're right on the, on, the, on the end of the wagon, you may be eating some dust, but it's okay because you know you're provided for, you know you're protected because nobody's getting to the king. You know that you're going to be uh, prepared. All these things are going to be happening. And so as you're going in that direction, you know you're fine. And so God is saying, hey, I'm not looking for fans in 2020. I'm looking for followers. I'm not looking for feeble people who can't do anything. I'm looking for faithful people who will do what I've called them to do and establish their purpose on earth so that they can make a difference in this world for my kingdom's sake. And so as we understand that, we have to get to this context of direction because we have to understand we're going somewhere. You're headed somewhere right now. What path are you going down? What is your direction? Is it up? Is it down? Is it east? Is it west? Is it north? Is it south? I've noticed the birds are migrating. The other day we saw such a flock of birds being Christian. It was, it was amazing. It was like the movie. They were, I thought, you know, I mean, it was ridiculous. They were going as far as the eye could see, at least a mile or two wide, and all the sky was black in the path that they made. She was like, Daddy, what is that? I said, it's the birds. They're migrating. You see, they know that the season is here to change direction. And I wonder if you know this morning that your season is here. To everything, there's a purpose. To everything, there's a season. Your season is here to change direction. It's time for you to begin following the will of God for your life. The perfect will, Romans 12 and 2 said. You see, direction is guidance or supervision of action or conduct. It's working under the direction of something. In the archaic, the address placed on the outside of a letter or package to be delivered. An explicit instruction is assistance in pointing out the proper route. And it's the line or course in which something is moving or is aimed to move or along which something is pointing or facing. You see, when the children of Israel came out of Egypt... God directed them. The Bible tells us that God will direct or order the steps of a righteous man or woman. 
And what he means by that is, I want to help you with this because this is where we mess up. We mess up because we're not willing to take the first step because we want to be at the last step. I was in a meeting with pastors yesterday over at Pastor Steele's church and I was giving some advice to them and I told them, I said, listen guys, I said, God is showing me so many tremendous things in this season of my life and I want you to understand we all want to get to the finish line. But don't rush the process. God reminded me when I was a kid, one of my favorite things to do as a child was to do adopt to dot. Does anybody else remember Dot the Dots? And the reason I liked it is because it was so intriguing and so mysterious. Because when I looked at the page, all I saw was a bunch of numbers and a bunch of dots. And I was like, this is a wreck. This is a mess. There can't nothing good come out of this. Now, maybe my little mind wasn't working that intrinsically, but now it does. It's like I remember what I was kind of thinking. I, I might have said some other things in my little key brain. But I was like, how can this be? Why is the teacher giving me this? And she's like, Jody, all you got to do is start at point one. And then you're going to go to point two. And it was only if I followed each step that when I was finished, man, there's a beautiful butterfly. And now I've got the pattern. I've got the outline of the butterfly. And it's up to me to color it in. And this morning, I want you to understand that life is a lot like a dot to dot. God says, I'm going to order your steps. Well, we've got step counters now on our Fitbits and our iWatches. And we're like, how many steps did I take today? But they don't even trace your steps. They don't take you back and say, well, this is where you've stepped all day. But what if we go back and we do some retrospective? And we say, God, where is my steps taking me in this past year? If we do some introspecting and we say, God, where has my steps led me internally, spiritually, this past year? What if we do some prospecting? And what if we say, hey, God, you know what? You told Joshua, as he took over from Moses, listen, that everywhere his foot steps Everywhere his foot stepped in faith following you that you'd give it to him. I believe God's got things for you this year that he said if you'll just take a step of faith. We walk by, come on church, we walk by faith and not by sight. You see, God is telling you step out of the water. Peter had to take a step. It's all about the first step. And when you take that step, you begin to walk in faith. So God, I'm at point one. You just said, step out. I've stepped out. It's 2020. I'm, I'm stepping out in faith this year. I'm going to work on me. I'm going to work on me so I can help other people be better. In whatever area it is. I'm going to work on me so that I can understand I have value. So I can add value to others. And then you get that direction because the Bible says, my sheep know my voice and they follow the shepherd. And this morning as we follow him, there's times, if I'm being honest, that it stops me in my tracks and I'm like, oh man, I, God, I don't look too good up there. It's awful stormy. He's like, okay, it's good. I'm up on the mountain and I see your destination where I want to take you. And I see the storm that's going to fight against you getting there. But know this, when the storm comes, the Savior will walk on top of the storm. And I'll comment for you if you're going in my direction. He says, know this. He says, I want to pray like David this morning. And I sent out a message to several of my pastor friends this morning. And I gave this text. And I said this. I said, I decree and I declare this over your life this year and over your ministry. Now some people say, well, you get the right. Remember what? I'm king. And king's decree. <coughs> Number two, Job said the good decree of that. So I said, I decree and declare it. That this is a declaration I want for your life. This is a promise I want for your life this morning. I want it for your ministry. I was thinking about you guys, and I want it for you. Because here's the context, is that if we understand that God, David said this year is going to be a good year surrounded with your blessings and your bounty. 
And if we follow you and we're behind your wagon tracks, I'm not going to touch the wagon. I'm not going to get in the wagon. I'm just following the wagon. I'm following the royal chair. And in the tracks, every time it bounces, every time we hit a bump in the road, you get blessed not because of the bump, because in the bumps is when everything spills out of the wagon. And when it spills out, all you got to do is be like Ruth and say, there's a handful of purpose on purpose. I'm going to take that. And this morning, you just keep going forward. I don't know about you, but I, I do. More than ever, more than ever, I have declared in my life that this year and this decade will be the best year, will be the best decade of my life. You say, yeah, but you don't know what's coming. No, but I know who holds my future. I know who holds my future. And I know if I'm following him, I can't go wrong. I can't go wrong. If I face tribulation, I'm glad he's with me. If I go through testing, I'm glad he's there. If I get in the fire, I'm glad there's a fourth man in there with me. If I go to the lion's den, I'm glad he can shut his mouth. If whatever, whatever, whatever may come, he is with me. And I'm just going to keep following the way. And this morning, maybe you just take a moment, if you can. I just, I just want you to close your eyes, and I want you to take a moment and really think about this message. And I want you to inspect your life right now. Right now. I want you to take a critical, a critical assessment of you. I don't want you to worry about the person to your left and to your right, in front of or behind you. I want it to be all about you for a minute. I know that's contradictory to what we learned, but I want it to be all about you. And I want you to say, God, how is my, can you show me, can you search me, can you pull up a screen for me real quick and show me a playback of my last year, of my last 10? <coughs> God, can I see what you see? And as I look at that, God, how's it played out? How's it played out for you? How's it played out for you? Am I following Romans 12? Am I fulfilling your perfect and acceptable will for my life? Or is it your permissive? Because I want to move from permissive to perfect. So as you're looking at that and you're dealing with the inspection of retrospection, let, let's move forward and let's say, God, can I introspect myself? What is it in me? Search me and see if there's any wickedness in me. God, what is it you're leading me to do that I'm failing to do? What is my sins of omission and my sins of commission? Meaning, what is my sins that I'm, I'm involved in that I know I shouldn't be doing? And what is the sins that I'm not doing that I know I should be doing? And that's what Paul said. He did some introspection. And then let's move on forward. Because if we stay in those two spots, we will get discouraged, we'll feel defeated, we'll be deflated, <coughs> we, we'll just be in trouble. But, but I want to encourage you because... The best is yet to come. I want to encourage you because your latter days will be greater than your former days. I want to encourage you because God created you not to be the tail but the head, not to be below but above. And this morning I want to encourage you to prospect, to prospect, to prospection. I want you to, I want you to look forward and I want you to say, God, I'm going to in faith believe. That you're going to empower me, equip me, enable me to make this next decade everything you want it to be for you. And now you're headed in the direction. You're going to leave the past behind and not looking backward in the sense of staying there, in the sense of regretting leaving, in the sense of I want to go back to what I used to be. No, no. You're going to be moving forward. You're going to be moving onward. You're going to be moving in the direction that God is leading. And as you do that, I promise you by the word of God, I decree and declare it over you this morning that God told me to tell you if you will follow him, this can be the best 10 years of your life. If you follow him and you get in his paths of his wagon tracks, that he will drop abundance for you in your life. That you can begin living the abundant life. You say, preacher, that mean I'm going to be rich. You'll be rich in things that nobody can take away. You'll be able to sleep at night. You'll be able to eat. You'll be able to, you'll be able to have peace with God. Because you're in his purpose. 
And isn't that worth more than everything? As I close this morning, I'm done. But Steve Jobs said this as he was laying on his dead, deathbed, dying of cancer, a billionaire, a multi-billionaire. He said, you know what I've realized in these last moments of my life? All the money in the world doesn't matter. He said, whether you have a $300 watch or a $3 watch, it still tells time. Whether you drive a $500,000 car or a $50,000 car or a $5,000 car, they all get you to where you're going. He said, what I've realized is having peace is the most important thing. That's real success, folks. And this morning, God has sent me to tell you the only way to have real peace is to find your purpose and to walk it and to live it and to thrive instead of survive. Now, this morning... I've, I've been doing this all week. I'm going to continue doing it. And I'm going to continue to set goals for myself this year. I'm going to continue to ask God to show me and give me some vision for this year. For my personal life, for my professional life, for my pastoral life, for everything. For my marriage, for my friends. How am I going to be a better friend? Everything. How am I going to take care of myself better physically? Everything. Because I belong to Him. And so this morning as you do that, I want to open up this altar. And I want us to stand on our feet. And I want you to come. I want you to come and I want you to have a talk with, with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I want, to have, I want you to discuss with Him. God, this is what I feel like you've shown me in my retrospect. This is what you show me in my introspection. This is what you show me in my prospection. This is what you show me. And God, I, 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 I refuse. I just refuse to continue to stay the way I am. You know, the definition of insanity is continuing to do the things you've always done the same way of expecting a change. It's time for a change, church. It's time for a change. You say, preacher, I'm old. I'm in my 80s. I, hey, you're alive. You're breathing. There's a reason. There's a reason. There's a purpose. When your purpose runs out, you'll be the first to be, a, to, be, to be made aware. You'll be the first one to know. And you have to decide on purpose to live in purpose. And so this morning, will you make a decision? Will you come and say, God, I know what you've shown me you want to do. Now, give me the ability to see it through. Give me the tenacity. To not give up when the fighting gets hard. Give me the determination to reach my destiny. If I end up like Joseph in the pit or the prison, let me know this can't be where I stay because this is not attached to my final purpose. It's just a pit stop on the way. This morning, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you. The Bible says, Be you not hearers of the word only, but doers the doers. And so many people are missing their blessings. They're missing God's call on their life. Just think about this. We'd never have the nation we have today if Abraham would have stayed home. You can stop your blessing. If Abraham would have stayed in Ur, he'd have never stood on the mountains, been willing to sacrifice his son. And we would have the blessings of God through Abraham. He might have used some other guy, but it wouldn't have been Abraham. And this morning, I don't want you to miss your blessing. Father, we love you today, and we thank you, God, for your blessings. God, I pray this morning that as we take a complete inspection of our life, as Paul did in Philippians 3, that, God, that we could remember what you brought us through and remember the mistakes we've made as a learning tool. But God, that we would not in no way, shape, or form allow that to be the place we set up camp. But instead, God, we would follow you. We would decide to be faithful. We would decide to lay down our lives so that we could follow Jesus, which is our reasonable form of worship. God, this morning I pray as we go into 2020. God, I know in a room this size with this many people, there's going to be people that miss their blessing. It's just what it is. Because there's some people that just don't move on faith and they don't take action. 
And faith without works is dead. But God, I pray that you would help our unbelief. Increase it, Lord. God, help those that have faith as a grain of mustard seed to see the mountains move to their life. Help us to be overcomers in this coming year. Help us to be victors in Jesus. And God, I pray that we would see the greatest transformation for the kingdom of God in our personal lives that we've ever seen. Jesus, I love you today. And I thank you that we have the option of dying full or dying empty. And God, I pray you let me die bone dry empty. That I don't need nothing undone. That I can be like Paul and I can say I finished my race. I fought the good fight of faith. I'm ready to die. I'm finished. God, let that be for all of us in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. You can be seated this morning. Let's take our Sunday morning offering and ask you to give today as God has given to you. Not because you have to, but because you're blessed to. Amen. Now, I told you a moment ago, Malachi 3 and 10 says, and let me tell you why. Because the Bible is very instructive and intuitive. And it tells us, basically, that God is doing tithing as a trust exercise. And he wants to see if he can trust you with pennies before he'll trust you with purpose. Amen? And so if he can see that he can trust you with something that he paves his road with, then he says, okay, now I can give them the blessing, their purpose, and I can watch what God, what I'll do with that. It'll be so great they can't even contain it. And I don't know about you, but I, I'm going to have something so big that I can't contain. Amen? And it's not for me, it's for him. And so this morning, I encourage you, let God know he can trust you. You can give this morning through cash, check. Or you can give online through our apps, which is Givelify, as well as PayPal. For those that are watching online today, they can do that as well. We appreciate them being with us. This morning, let's bless the offering. Father, we thank you for the funds, the finances that you've blessed us with and entrusted to us. And God, today we pray and we ask you, Lord, that you would bless tremendously every person that is faithful in giving. God, maybe the person has already messed up this week and they don't have the full tithe to give and they sure don't have an offering above the tithe to give, but they have something. God, I pray that you'd bless that something. I'm glad you're a God that can take nothing and turn it into something. And so God, take what they have and as they give it in a form of obedience and a heart of cheerfulness to give something to you, then I pray that you'd bless whatever the size gift from whatever person. And God, help us here at Transformation be good stewards. And God, let us be able to reach more of this world for Jesus in 2020 and this next decade than we even can imagine. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. We're not